Coming up on the special Skybox edition of Max TV, we take a look at Mosley Margarito. We review Boxing After Dark and we go through news and notes. Coming up on the next round. And welcome to the next round, Steve Kim, joined as always by Gabriel Montoya. We take a look at the sport of boxing in a beautiful L.A. background. We're just one week from today. The WBA welterweight title is on the line. It's the L.A. showdown from the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Antonio Margarito takes on Sugar Shane Mosley. And the question is, Gabe, very simple. Is this fight better on paper in terms of tradition and lineage than it is in reality in the year 2009? I would have to say, yeah, it, it is. Um, it's a great matchup, but it would have mattered more about three years ago. Mosley is, is even further away from his prime. Um, I'm, I'm having to predict a, a late stoppage just based on the fact that I don't think at his age he's going to be able to stick with the jab and move around and, and keep Margarito off of him. That is a bold prediction. You're laying your cards right there on the table. Let's take a look at their last fights. We all know what the Tijuana Tornado did, stopping Miguel Cotto in 11 rounds. And, Gabriel, I thought it was a classic display, almost Chavez-like, in terms of breaking down an opponent, walking him down, and systematically breaking him down piece by piece. It's the type of performance that lends you to believe maybe Miguel Cotto would never be the same. That's the type of effect Antonio Margarito has on his opponents. Yeah, he didn't just break him down. He broke his will, and that's something that may not be repaired in this next fight. We'll see. You know, Michael Jennings is a tough guy. Um, I, I look for that fight to go the distance, but it remains to be seen what Miguel Cotto is going to have left after such a brutal beatdown. Well, Gabriel, everyone talks about what Miguel Cotto went through. Listen, this fight was no walk in the park for Antonio Margarito, the Tijuana Tornado. And seeing him after that fight and interviewing him, I have never seen him that damage. Let's not get this twisted. Both men got put through the meat grinder, and we don't know what Antonio Margarito has left in that gas tank. Both fighters' career may have been irrevocably changed on that particular night. On the flip side, taking a look at Shane Mosley, September 27th, he would stop Ricardo Mayorga in dramatic fashion in the final seconds in the 12th and final rounds. I have to tell you, it was an emphatic victory. He put an exclamation point on that performance. But for much of that night, Gabe, I got to tell you, he looked like a fighter who had turned the corner. Absolutely. His, his legs looked a little shaky. He looked unsure of himself. He looked like he couldn't pull the trigger. And, and this is the thing about Mayorga. Uh, the last two guys that fought him and then went on to fight an elite fighter lost. De La Hoya went on to fight Mayweather and lost. Tito uh, went on to fight M uh, Winky Wright and he lost. Mayorga is not a tune-up for the elites, apparently. And I think it's going to be the case here again. You know, expounding on your point, uh, I've heard a lot of people say, well, Shane Mosley had problems because of the style of Ricardo Mayorga and blah, blah, blah. Those two guys that you just mentioned right now, Felix Trinidad and Oscar De La Hoya, coming off a of long layoff, they certainly didn't have any problems <laughs> with the style no. of Ricardo Mayorga. Uh, I think there's a couple of storylines in this fight. It's number one, I think most people do expect the Tijuana Tornado to come out victorious and really go on to bigger and better things. I also believe this is the last stand of Shane Mosley. Shane Mosley made it very clear at the press conference, I am the king of L.A. and I am defending my throne. I think the question is, like you've already stated, can Antonio Margarito stop Sugar Shane Mosley? No one's ever done it before. Gabe, I'm on your bandwagon. I think Margarito not only wins, I think he wins late. I think Mosley wins early rounds with the speed and athleticism. But I just wonder, are there too many miles on the odometer? Here's what I think is the big story. And we talk about the, who is the real champion or the linear champion. Gabe, there's going to be 18,000 people plus in a sold-out Staples Center that do not give a damn who the real or recognized champion is. The bigger storyline is this is a fight where I believe Antonio Margarito seems to have arrived as a marquee name. Absolutely. The sellout arena in an L.A. or in a metropolitan city really speaks volumes to the fact that two years ago, Antonio Margarito was a relatively anonymous figure in the sport of boxing. I think this says it right here. In a couple days, there will be a sold-out arena because of the name Antonio Margarito. Absolutely. I think, I think you're right on. You know, that maybe linear doesn't matter as much because you know, the titles have changed hands so many times. There's, there's four different belts. It's hard to keep track. But a guy that can sell out, hey, he's the people's champion. Yes, yeah, so we'll see it. What happens? Saturday night on HBO, Antonio Margarito takes on Sugar Shane Mosley. We come back. We take a look at Boxing After Dark. Moving on to round two of the next round, Steve Kim, Gabriel Montoya talking boxing this past weekend. It was the kickoff of HBO's 2009, and they had a good one from the Beau Rivage in Biloxi, Mississippi, for the WBC welterweight title. Andre Berto improves to 24 and 0, winning a close 12 round decision over the game. Louis Colazo drops to 29 and 4. Your scores 116, 111, and two judges with the scores of 114. 
113. Um, here's what I think, Gabe. I think this was a very good fight, very, very competitive. I think the one score, 116, 111, certainly out of line with what everyone else had it. But I think that Louis Colazzo showed once again, he's a world-class fighter. He can give anyone difficulty on a particular night. But I just wonder if there is something missing there that keeps him from going over the top into really becoming a status holding welterweight in the game currently. Yeah, you know, the, the, the big question about Berto coming into this fight was his chin. And coming out of the fight, I'm still questioning his chin. But the one thing I can't question about him is his heart. When the fight was on the line in the 12th, both corners giving inspirational speeches, trying to rile their guy up, it was Berto that came in and closed the show. And that was really the difference in the fight. Not on my scorecard, but on the judges' scorecard. I have to be honest. I thought Colazzo won the fight. So did I. Uh, I thought the first six rounds, I thought that Louis Colazzo won at least four of those rounds. Mm -hmm. Then you had the point deduction by referee Keith Hughes for holding. We'll talk about that later. But I, here's what I think. I think that one guy really finished stronger, and that was Andre Berto. Obviously, his physical strength and his punching power were very, very instrumental in winning this fight on the judges' scorecards. But the bottom line is, if you score a fight, it's a 12-round grid. A winning a round in the first four rounds counts every bit as much as the championship rounds. There's no extra points given for winning the championship rounds. I give Berto credit, though. A lot of young fighters, namely Jeff Lacey, for instance, mm -hmm. who are blowing out people early on, the first time in their lives they face real resistance. I've seen young kids pack up and fold their tents. Berto didn't do that. He did not act like a front runner. So whether you think he won or lost, I think this experience is very, very positive for young Berto. Yeah, it's, it's the kind of fight that he should have had before he got the WBC belt, where you find out exactly what your guy has, what he's made of. And we found out that you know, he does have championship stuff. And whether or not he can beat all the other elite fighters, I don't know. But this is certainly a fight that he can take back to the gym and, and expound on. He, he can find all his flaws because they're all there. When I mean, he was moving the wrong way all night against a southpaw, uh, maybe these guys need to watch more HBO fights because the announcers seem to know which way to move, but yeah. the fighters just don't. Um, I think th there's a lot to be learned here in this fight. And I can make an argument that Colazzo did lose the fight. I don't call it an outright robbery. But for me, you know, uh, it seemed like the HBO announcers, much like Corte De La Hoya, they forgave the guy losing the fight because he had a big 12th round, and I just don't agree. Well, I think all you have to do when you talk about that point was after the fight, they had this feature where Max Kellerman was narrating that these are the fighters that we are going to fe uh, feature in the future. These are our future stars. So already when you have Andre Berto on that graphic after the fight, I think mm -hmm. it was quite clear that the HBO narrative was, we know who we want to win. Andre Berto. Louis Colazzo is a guy that came in with three losses, is not really a marketable guy, no. and is a guy that if he walked buck naked in the middle of the street, people in Brooklyn still wouldn't recognize him. So the narrative was set from Lennox Lewis to Max Kellerman <laughs> and to perhaps even Bob Papa. And I still agree with you. Even though he survived 12 rounds and a lot of leather was thrown his way, Louis Colazzo is a pop gun, and yet he was still able to buzz Andre Berto early on. Here's what I think. I'm going to say it again. Andre Berto is a good young fighter, but don't confuse the fact with having a world championship belt with being among the very, very best in this business. As of right now, I still think uh, Antonio Margarito, Paul Williams, Miguel Cotto, are at least those three guys are above Andre Berto in the welterweight hierarchy. Yeah, without question. It's almost like he went from prospect and, and kind of crossed over into contender status despite having that belt. Yeah. Um, I think they won't recognize uh, Colazzo, but they certainly would remember him if he was buck naked in the middle of Brooklyn. The thing that, that got me about this fight is that uh, apparently bo body punching isn't scored because mm. he, was, he was owning Berto's body. Every time they got in close, uh, it seemed like Colazzo had really studied the, the Stevie Forbes fight because Forbes figured out about three, four rounds in that if you go inside on Berto, he just stops. All he can do is hold. He doesn't really have an inside game other than winging that big uppercut. And I thought Colazzo really took advantage of that all night long. You know, I got to give kudos to referee Keith Hughes. I thought he did a great job. In the beginning, I thought, wow, he was awfully hasty in taking away a point from Andre Berto. But you know what? As I look at the fight and the ebb and flow and the fact that Andre Berto could not grapple or maul on the inside, he had to move his hands, which in turn gave the opponent, Louis Colazzo, opportunities to work. Because this is boxing. This is not the MMA. Gabe, I wish more referees would take a hard line early in fights and tell guys if you break the rules of boxing and clinching is against the rules if you look it up, yeah. I think you'd have much better fights because I think this fight was definitely aided by the call of referee Keith Hughes. Absolutely. He kept the action going. He didn't break them too quick. He, he gave them a couple seconds, action slowed, and he broke them. But what I really liked about what he did was that he was consistent. He gave the warning, he gave another one, he gave another one, and then he took a point. It drives me crazy watching refs, you know, whether it's holding or hitting behind the head or any other infraction, where they just warn all night long for 10 or 12 rounds and they never do anything. I had to applaud him for it. I wasn't sure about 
taking a point that soon, but you know, the guy was consistent, and I'll go with that. I think we had the first very, very good fight of 2009. We'll see it stand up, if it stands up, to the fight of the year discussions 12 months from now. But Berto Colazzo, I thought, was a razor-thin fight. Me, personally, I had Colazzo winning the fight, as did many other people, but certainly not a robbery. I think this fight begs and screams for a rematch. Absolutely. I, th I think Berto could, could really uh, learn a lot from the first fight and take it into the second fight and maybe get a stoppage. Um, there's certainly a lot of room to grow here, and it definitely screams for a rematch. If there's any justice in boxing, and there kind of isn't, there will be a rematch. So there it is for Boxing After Dark. We come back, we wrap it up with news and notes. And we are back. We wrap it up with news and notes. Steve Kim, Gabriel Montoya talking boxing. We take a look at the fight review on Showbox this past Friday night. Featherweights in action. Orlando Cruz with an upset by stopping Leonino Miranda in five rounds. And Marvin Quintero bangs out Nick Cassell in three. Then on Friday night fights, Aramiselli Alba with a 10-round decision over Jermaine Sanders. And Angel Hernandez with a 10-round decision over James McGirt Jr. Last week we talked about it, Gabe. This guy with this huge, humongous record looking like a monster. And we had never seen anything about him. And I've always said, those records, when they're that big and we've never seen these guys... They're kind of like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. <laughs> They're like these urban legends. We don't know how real they are. Turns out he really wasn't that real. What I found interesting was, even though Cruz had about half the fights of Miranda, it looked to me like Cruz was the much more seasoned professional fighter. Well, I think his amateur class showed. The guy's a former Olympian. He's had a ton of amateur fights compared to Miranda's only two amateur fights. And it just really showed the difference. I've seen about four or five fights of Miranda's, and he seemed much more relaxed in his hometown. Here it was the first time on TV, the first time in the U.S., all this pressure on him, and it just showed. He looked a little shaky, a little unsteady on his feet. He did kind of start to, to get into the fight and be more aggressive, and I think it was up on the cards when he got knocked out. But you could just see the class, how relaxed Cruz was. He had a game plan, and despite being down in the cards, he stuck to it, waited for his opening, and off a lazy jab from Miranda, just knocked him the hell out. Yeah, and that was a perfect counter left hand where he kind of rolled with that punch and came right back over the top. And that was uh, one of the early knockout of the year leaders. Oh, uh, Miranda was absolutely out on his feet. He was very, very valiant in trying to get up, but that fight was absolutely correct and being stopped by, I believe, referee Steve Smoger. There's another good-looking uh, southpaw on this card. Marvin Quintero would knock out Nick Cassell in three, who called it quits after three rounds. I think it's pretty clear Nick Cassell has had it. I think his career is effectively over. Yeah. Marvin Quintero, I like. I think he makes for very good television, Gabe. He seems to be a very exciting fighter, and he wants to mix it up. Those are the type of guys, to me, are the most entertaining in boxing. Yeah, no, for, for a southpaw, usually you hear a southpaw and you think, oh, it's going to be a bad matchup. Match it's going to be, uh, you know, kind of an ugly fight. This guy was all action. He stayed in the pocket. His defense kind of came on a little bit late. Uh, I'm not crazy about the amount of punches he likes to take, but clearly Casal can bang, and the guy clearly has a, has a chin. Yes. I want to see more. Absolutely, Gabriel. I agree. Taking a look at some tidbits as we wrap it up here on the next round, WBC junior middleweight title, Sergio Martinez and Kermit Cintron. They will battle it out. That has been added to the card that already has Alfred Angulo against Ricardo Mayorga and Nate Campbell against Ali Funica. Then on March 7th, boxing after dark, a couple of fights have been set here. James Kirkland will take on Joel Julio, and then Victor Ortiz will take on Vivian Harris. Then reports are March 28th, Jermaine Taylor will be moving to Showtime couple of opponents being mentioned, Glenn Johnson, Carl Frock, and Andre Ward going back up top. Finally, Sergio Martinez finds an opponent. Yeah. I think this is an interesting fight. Uh, Kermit Cintron could have had a shot at Joshua Clotty for a welterweight title. Instead, he moves up, and the reason was very, very simple. He gets paid more to face Sergio Martinez. <laughs> yeah, it, it, and, and like I, I think I said in the last episode, the 154-pound division is wide open. Uh, you got a lot of prospects like uh, or contenders like uh, Joel Julio. You got uh, James Kirkland, Alfred Angulo that are kind of coming into their own and, and trying to get a toehold on the division. And now you have uh, Kermit Cintron, who was a, was a decent champion at, at uh, 147, is a really good fighter, and he, he's coming up and, and trying to get a get a foothold there. Uh, I like this fight a lot. Interesting stat about this fight: these two guys combined have about 70 to 80 fights with three losses. All three losses to one guy, Antonio Margarito. So they're going to call this the Tijuana Tornado Bowl. Uh, March 7th, a <laughs> couple of interesting fights here. Uh, James Kirkland, Joel Julio, to me, is a shootout. I think it's 50-50 to a certain oh. degree. However, this other fight, Victor Ortiz against Vivian Harris, to me, I, I think Vivian Harris is going to get beat like a pinata. I saw his last fight against the journeyman where he was absolutely the beneficiary of a very, very long count. 
I think Victor Ortiz wins this fight literally within the first two rounds. I, I can't decide what's gone more from Harris, his, his mental edge or his legs. Yeah, I, I see this as a pretty early knockout win and a good name, a good scalp maybe a couple years ago. Now it's it's just going to be a name to look up on box rec. And uh, Joe Julio, I don't want to say he's just become a name opponent, but I still think he's very dangerous, especially against B-level opponents. I don't know where Kirkland really stands, but I think he's dangerous, but he certainly never faced a guy with the offensive arsenal of Joe Julio thus far in his career. I'm really high on Kirkland. I've been following him for, for several years now, watched about 10, 12 of his fights. The thing that I've noticed about him is it all depends on his preparation. Some fights he's in incredible shape. Other times he doesn't quite get the sparring out there in Houston. And, and then he kind of shows it a little bit lackluster. But uh, despite how fast he comes out and leaves his chin wide open, he does have boxing skills. If you go back and look at the Aussie Duran fight, a fight that he had maybe six rounds of sparring, wasn't quite in the shape, just had to make weight, basically. Uh, he showed that he can box and take a guy, be extended a little bit, take a guy into deep waters, and then stop him. Um, this is a 50-50 fight if ever there was one. I think Julio's got a little bit more of an edge in terms of experience, but I like Kirkland to edge this one out in an early fight of the year candidate. The thing that makes this exciting is that Kirkland, even when he blows guys out like Alan Conyers and Ricardo Cortez, his chin has been punctured and his backside has been on the canvas. James Kirkland may not be great, we're going to see, but I know one thing he is, he's absolutely fun to watch. And Gabe, I don't know what's going to happen if, if Jermaine Taylor actually goes to showtime. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, Jim Lampley may be in mourning. He may never get over Jermaine Taylor leaving HBO. We may, we may never actually hear and a big right hand that from misses, Jermaine Taylor. That misses. That misses. Uh, <laughs> of these three opponents, Glenn Johnson, Carl Frock, and Andre Ward, do you agree with me that the toughest matchup would be Glenn Johnson at 170? For Jermaine Taylor's style, absolutely. A guy that's going to pressure him, is going to be there all night, that has a granite chin, is going to throw a million punches. That's a, that's a terrible, terribly tough fight for him. Yeah, Andre Ward, Jermaine Taylor, to me looks like a very awkward fight. I don't know if that's going to work out. I know Andre Ward is taking on Henry Buchanan in a couple weeks here on Showbox. I think the Carl Frock fight, the WBC Super Middleweight Championship, I think that's a 50-50 fight. Uh, Carl Frock, to me, is a good, solid, durable guy. Nothing really special, but he's going to hang in there and fight. And I think him and Jermaine Taylor... That is a very, very good fight. Yeah, Carl Frock is a guy that you know, he doesn't have spectacular speed, spectacular power, but what he does is, is he has overall great skills, and I think that might be enough to edge out Taylor, who at this late stage of his career is still kind of finding himself. Well, Gabe's uh, episode number two with you. I tell you what, I cannot wait till Saturday night. I, I think it's going to be a great fight. I thought this fight, Margarito Mosley, did not belong at the MGM Grand, did not belong mm -hmm. at the Mandalay Bay. It belonged one place, the Staples Center in L.A., and 18,000. I think this is one of the bigger nights in L.A. boxing history in years. And I'd, I'd actually say it's the biggest night in L.A. boxing history since the time Shane Mosley became a superstar, June 17, 2000, when there was about 15,000, 16,000 paid when he beat Oscar De La Hoya. I think it's going to be a great atmosphere because the one thing I like about non-casino settings is that the real fans actually show up early and they are loud and they get their money's worth. Yeah, they're going to be there from the first fight to the last moment. and It's going to be a great atmosphere. I can't wait. I yes. just absolutely can't wait. And we'll talk about it next week. So on behalf of Gabriel Montoya and the rest of Max Boxing, till the next round, goodbye everybody.